the D-Day is finally here. India's tryst with the goods and services tax completes one year. A year that has seen some highs, some lows and lots of confusion. ET now decodes one year of GST with surveys, debates and special discussions. Catch the unmissable coverage of one year of GST only on ET now. Good evening and welcome to this special edition of the India Development Debate. I'm Sandeep Gurumurthy joining in from the News Centre in Mumbai. Joining me in Delhi is my colleague and co-anchor Supriya Shrinath. It's clearly a rise with India moment as far as the country's tax system is concerned. As the uniform goods and services tax completes one year, there seem to be more hits than misses. The big switch has been rather seamless, save some glitches in the initial stages. From Kashmir to Kerala, states have embraced the new tax regime despite political differences. Industry, which was initially reluctant to come on board, now says GST has surely helped them streamline their supply chains and movement of goods pan India. The biggest worrying point has been the weak tax collections, although there are signs of a pickup of late. Indeed, of course, a lot needs to be done. After all, GST is still work in progress. First and foremost, the eBay bill rollout has not been glitch-free. Second, the input credit mechanism needs some big tweaks to ensure that big money of industry and traders are not locked up in the system. The biggest worries of them all is, of course, the ambiguous anti-profiteering norms, which are keeping businesses on the tenterhooks. Also, the five-tier tax slabs work against the principle of one nation, one tax, while many crucial items like petroleum products and real estate are still out of the GST ambit. As India's largest tax reform ever turns one, we at ET now look at the hits and the misses of GST on a flagship show, the India Development Debate tonight. And joining us on the show is, of course, an extremely special guest, uh, Mr. Hasmukh Adia, India's Revenue and, of course, India's Finance Secretary and one of the key architects of the GST and how it has rolled out. And he perhaps deserves many a credit for what is largely a seamless rollout of a reform as big as that. Thank you very much, Mr. Adia, for joining us. One really has to begin by first congratulating you for playing your part in the GST rollout and being constantly vigilant, uh, constantly eager, constantly ready to change things uh, as and when it was demanded by the industry and stakeholders. While no one can dispute the need for this tax, I mean, this tax was in the making for 10 years. It was important it happened. The criticism is that because of the teething troubles like high rates, IT infra, refunds, e-way bill, etc., it has not been able to achieve some of its main objectives. Now, as one of the key architects, how are you going to rate the rollout one year later? And where, according to you, has it fallen short on your own expectations? Well, if I may tell you, the uh, GST has settled down very well in a period of one year. The kind of problems which you have mentioned, uh, they are always expected in any new system of taxation. So, since this was a new system, obviously there would be some initial glitches. And the glitches were not unsurmountable. We have been able to get over them easily because of our willingness to change at every moment. So, we have made so many changes in our notification rules and laws since we implemented GST. And they are all making the implementation process very, very smooth now. The main problem we faced was on account of technological challenges. And second one was on account of the, uh, you know, uh, this being a new law, the dissemination of information right up to the last person, that was a major task. And so that took some time for people to understand that what are the nitty gritties of this, how to file a return and how to take refund, etc. People made so many mistakes in their refund applications that we had to sort of find special ways to give them refund through manual process also. But I'm glad that even that major impediment of export refund has been got over. As of now, according to my information, 90% of the refund due has already been given. And if you take the old refund prior to April 2018, I think it is uh, almost 100% that we have given. There may be still some cases which are very difficult cases to crack. And I would request those companies or those parties to kindly approach the respective jurisdictional commissioners to sort out their issues. 
Uh, Mr. Adhya, before we get down to the specifics, we'd like to step back and look at the big objective. Has GST, according to you, been able to achieve its big objective of formalizing the economy? You know, uh, an HSBC report points that glitches in GST regime have, have increased the demand for cash instead. What do you believe needs to be done from here on for achieving that big objective of formalization of the economy? Because GST has to be seen in the context of other steps taken by the government to formalize the economy. Well, if you take formalization as an objective, there are two goals for formalization. One goal could be that how many more new people are joined, uh, joining the new tax system. If you take the pre-GST figure of about 65 to 67 lakh people who were part of the indirect tax chain, now it is 114, uh, malab, 1 lakh 40,000, uh, 1 crore 14 lakh people who are already in the GST net. So that is one specific target which tells us that many more taxpayers are coming in the tax net. That is an indication of formalization. The second indication of formalization could be that are we getting more revenue compared to the pre-GST or not. Now if you take the calculation, rough calculation which our chief economic advisor has made in one of the articles, he has pointed out that if you take all the collection, CGST, SGST, IGST as a whole, and if you do comparison of total revenue in the GST era vis-a-vis -vis in the pre-GST era, the growth rate, minimum growth rate in the last one year has been at least 13 percent. Now this is also a significant achievement and I would like to think that if one is getting a 13 percent uh, growth rate in the first year where there are implementation glitches also, then I think we are actually moving in the era of formalization. The third thing I want to tell you is that going forward when we have a system of return filing which is perfect in which there is a possibility of every invoice being matched with every other invoice, the, the, uh, the tax net will become even more secure and we will have much less leakages in the system and I think there would be much more level of formalization. Mr. Adhya, I, I couldn't agree with you more on this that, you know, if, uh, if, if there is a 13% growth in revenue in the first year where there were glitches, this is an encouraging sign. But just want to draw focus to absolute numbers. The tax collection is always a good metric to judge any tax reform by and something as big as the GST perhaps is best judged by that. March was the only month in which GST collections top that 1 lakh crore mark. Collections have mostly been hovering around 83,000 in November to say about 94,000 crore in April. Now, experts blame it on compliance and higher rates. Are you going to agree with them? Do you concede that perhaps compliance and higher interest rates, high, high rates, tax labs are to be blamed? And I also understand that given fiscal considerations and high oil prices, we will be dependent on indirect taxes. Uh, and, and given that reality, is there any scope for further rate rationalization? Well, I would think that we have to, of course, uh, go in the direction of having much less uh, slabs of taxation in the GST regime. Because the moment you have uh, so many slabs, or at least four slabs also, uh, the classification disputes would arise. And uh, there will also be some amount of duty inversion which can be expected in certain products. But we are going to give refund for duty inversion, so there is no problem. The scope has to be created for uh, rationalization of slabs. As of, now, as of now, I would think that we are still in the mode of stabilizing our revenue and we must watch for this particular year. Let us see how uh, and when can we have some more scope for rationalizing the tax rates. Uh, the general argument that higher the tax rate, more the evasion, of course, that is true for any commodity, you know, that generally happens. But I would like to think that uh, the honesty cannot be measured only by rate, you know, honesty is something personal to individuals. And so, if uh, certain people, and also honesty is a function of how much votes the government is keeping through the information technology and whether there is a chance of being caught or not. So because our system of taxation is end-to-end -end IT driven, I would like to believe that there is a much less scope for evasion. So even the items of 28% very difficult to 
evade taxes at least in the first or second level of uh, manufacturing or wholesale trading. But Mr. Adair, if I could ask a follow-up. So in principle, do you agree that this 28% slab must go as pointed by Chief Economic Advisor Arvind Subramaniam as well? And, and would, you, would you also say that it's unlikely to happen in the next year or two? Will it take time for, for this slab to be done away with? Well, let me ask you this question that if you remove 28% slab on cigarette, would you still like to collect sales or no? Fair point. So, the taxation will remain the same in some form, form or the other. Mm -hmm. The question is ki whether you collect it by way of GST up to 28% or whether you collect extra tax by way of sales. That is the only thing that is important. Of course, there are certain items of uh, production where there is no cess, the only the rate is 28 percent. The question is ki for them to be reduced to 18 percent, we need to have revenue scope. We should have scope in our revenue to reduce and take that kind of a revenue hit. So that is the only issue. But whether you abolish 28 percent, we can also say that from tomorrow all items of 28 percent will attract instead of 28 percent tax rate, 18 percent GST and 10 percent cess. But that is hardly going to be of any use to us, you know. Fair point. Uh, Mr. Adhya, in terms of revenue shortfall, the union territories like Daman and Diu, Dadar and Nagar Haveli and Puducherry have shortfall of about 74%, 59%, 49%. States like Himachal and Uttarakhand and Bihar and JNK also have a shortfall. There are about two, three states that have revenue surplus. Now, this is going to be a strain on your own resources because the center will have to compensate. How do you believe this is going to impact the center's own fiscal math? Well, if you remember, our entire mechanism of GST is designed in such a way by GST Council that there is no need for uh, dependence on Government of India for meeting with the compensation liability. The compensation liability is separately to be met with out of the compensation cess which is being collected from GST goods and services. So that way there is an independent mechanism. And that cess amount which is, uh, which is uh, uh, going to take care of the compensation, we have estimated absolutely correctly and I don't think there will be a need for us to exceed that amount of cess uh, collected. So Government of India doesn't have to give anything out of its own kitty, out of its own uh, uh, fiscal maths for any compensation. So there is an independent mechanism for it and we would be able to cop up with it. So, Mr. Adhya, in the last meeting, decided on bringing one return form. It was decided that the current system of filing summary returns GSTR 3B and final sales return GSTR uh, 1 would continue for six months. Are we on course for the transa transition and also, more importantly, on invoice match matching? You know, while that's been suspended uh, on account of uh, a lot of feedback that you got from traders, it's been suspended for six months. Will the government look at reintroducing invoice matching to avoid tax evasion? Because many experts believe that that's the only way to sort of check tax evasion and sections of industry also now feel the matching concept of purchase and sales invoice would protect them from future disputes uh, and penalties. So your thoughts on that as well, sir? Our uh, new system of uh, return filing, which we have promised, that is going to take care of this invoice matching. It will be a very simple uh, one single GST return and uh, we would uh, give the opportunity of informing everybody as to how many of your uh, pur uh, purchases are not uploaded by your sellers. If there are people from whom I have bought goods and if they have not uploaded the invoices on the system, then I would be informed about it. So like that, we have made a system. Everybody will be able to see how much is the gap between what they have purchased and how much uh, sellers have uploaded. And with this information being shared with every taxpayer, they will become very cautious, they will be able to deal with only uh, clean type of uh, dealers who are very regular in filing their returns so that the burden of uh, tax does not come on the purchaser because the tax is supposed to be collected by the seller and tax is supposed to be paid by the seller. So if the seller is a fly-by-night operator, it is very difficult for buyer to then deal with him. 
So the new system of return filing will exactly take care of this. Fair point indeed, and I think you've been uh, you've been very agile and very alert in taking care of that feedback on filing that you got, uh, sir. I do want to shift focus and talk to you about this growing clamor uh, that there is. Each time there is a fuel price hike, everybody believes as if the GST has some magic wand. I mean, crude prices have been volatile, and the only solution to that seems to be put it under the GST and everything will be taken care of. But as somebody who understands finance and the revenue implication of this, is this going to be as easy? Because won't revenue neutral rate A make it a difficult proposition because rates could go up in some states? Besides, you know, how likely are states to be on board for a move as big as this 10 months before general elections? Well, if you ask me, a uh, lot of people are talking about it. GST, as you rightly mentioned, is not a magic wand which will solve the problem of oil price volatility. If the oil price is volatile, then the only way to have a stable, suppose if uh, somebody is asking for a stable regime of petroleum prices, which may not in itself be a desirable indicator, the question is that that can only be done if either the state government or the cell government sacrifices. Now that is something which without GST also anybody can do. We don't have to go in for GST to do that. It's a simple mathematics that if after implementation of GST, if we have to continue to get the same level of revenue as we are getting now, and if it is a revenue neutral rate as you said, then where is the question of prices coming down? So that expectation that if petrol and diesel comes into GST, the prices will come down, that is not correct. The second question that you asked about what is the possibility of doing it, according to me, out of five commodities, there are two commodities which can probably be easy candidates, you know, and they are natural gas and ATF. Now it is for GST Council to debate about it, discuss it, and then decide about it. Okay, you're saying natural gas and ATF is easier to do uh, for obvious reasons, and that's that's something we hope to see some uh, headway on. Uh, but Mr. Adha, the idea from day one is to have a unique GST that suits the needs of India, and that's why we even started off with a four-rate structure. But now, a cess on sugar, sugar is being weighed upon. Won't it, in some sense, open a Pandora's box? I know you have a committee that's looking into it, but states like Kerala are opposing it, while sugar-producing states like UP and Maharashtra for obvious reasons, uh, you know, are backing it, already have a sugar package. Is there any merit, sir, in this demand? You know, I know the Attorney General has opined that a cess can be levied, but should we avoid distorting the GST structure through mechanisms like this? Well, since this matter is already before the group of ministers, which is a subcommittee of the GST Council, I would not like to comment on it at this stage. Okay. I, I appreciate the fact that you would want to comment on something that the council and, you know, a subgroup is looking at it, sir. But I think you've been very agile and I think congratulations come your way as far as dealing with export refunds are concerned. Of course, after, after some lag, after some glitch. Now, the council is right in its wisdom has opined a special refund window for them. About 12,000 crore refunds have been cleared out of 20,000 crore. The CBIC chairperson was on our channel about two days back and she says the aim is to get pendency at levels at about 500 crore rupees. Isn't it way too ambitious? And what exactly is the roadmap that you have to get to that number? Well, it is not at all ambitious. If you ask me, the initial glitches were on account of wrong filing of refund applications. People had filed different items in different columns. They did not know how to do it correctly. And that's why they were stuck up. Now, people have learned how to uh, make the correct application for refund, particularly the IGST refund. The major item of export refund is IGST refund, not the ITC refund. Now, the IGST refund system is designed in such a way that if you file your shipping bill correctly and if you file your return correctly, then within three days after filing your return, you will get your refund automatically. No manual intervention is required. And it is already happening in case of current refund. So people are now pleasantly surprised that there is no need to approach anybody. Within three days, automatically the refund comes. I'm talking about IGST refund. As far as ITC refund is concerned, there is still some amount of manual intervention required. And we will try and see how we can that uh, we can autom uh, autom uh, uh, make it automatic uh, there also.
Okay. Sir, I, I have to ask you a question. Uh, you know, builders, uh, stamp duty is anyways out of the GST and builders are not passing on the ITC benefits to home buyers. There seems to be an anomaly between ready to move in houses uh, that don't have GST and under construction houses that do. And a lot of people are now telling us, at least the feedback on the ground is that, uh, you know, buyers are not finding under construction houses attractive anymore. Do you believe this, this anomaly that has been created is there a case to review this proposition at all? Well, I don't think the gap is too much uh, between this. What happens is that uh, if you pay 12% GST on uh, under construction property, the builder is supposed to take input tax credit in respect of all the building material which he has purchased and on which he has paid GST. So this itself, as we have calculated, comes to at least 8% if not more. So actual burden is only of 4% on uh, under construction property. Now that much amount was earlier also the case, you know, earlier also there was a 5% uh, or so service tax and there was a 1% composite tax of VAT by most of the states. So earlier also the burden was 6%, now it is almost 5 to 6%. Now there is not too much of a gap there. In case of ready-made property, since you are not getting the input tax credit benefit, the inbuilt tax component is already making part of the cost, cost of the ready-made house. So that way there is not much difference. So the ready-made houses, even if there is no GST for the sake of saying that there is no GST, but the cost of GST paid on all the material, building material, is already inbuilt into the cost of the house. Quick question, sir, on the e-way bill. Uh, I know that's something that uh, that was a long-standing issue and it's now been put in place. How long do you think it will take for this system to stabilize and mature? Now, there have been reports of you know, how uh, some trucks in some parts of India are trying to game the system. What's your own sense of how much time it will take for this to mature? Well, already there is an uh, e-way bill uh, which is made applicable for the entire country, both for interstate as well as intrastate. Now the only question is we have to make 100% uh, transporters get into the habit of carrying EVA bill. Now that's what is the phase we are in. There are some random checkings being done by tax authorities on the road asking them if they are carrying the EVA bill. And once more and more transporters find that the cost of not carrying an EVA bill is much heavier compared to carrying an EVA bill, I'm sure 100% of the truckers would be carrying EVA bill. Once that happens, then we are rest assured because everybody's movement details are in our server. So we would then be able to compare them with their GST tax returns. Uh, one of the concerns is that the lack of an anti-profiteering methodology is not deterring the anti-profiteering authorities from deciding complaints filed before them. In fact, there's a threat of multiple advance ruling authorities issuing advance rulings on the same issue which are sort of contrary to each other. Uh, how will the government ensure a more credible mechanism? I mean, could a centralized advance ruling authority with regional benches be the answer? What are you looking at? No, are you talking about advance authority ruling or advance ruling authority or are you talking about anti-profiteering? Advance ruling, sir. Okay, fine. In advance uh, ruling authority, because there are many cases, you know, first of all, let me tell you that the ruling of uh, advance, uh, the advance ruling in respect of a person is only applicable to him. It is not applicable in general to anybody else. He has to give the facts of his case and based on the facts of his case only it is uh, given. And once it is given, it is only applicable to him. It is not even applicable to his neighbor. So that is one. The second thing is that there are so many multiple cases of advance uh, ruling uh, applications in a state that it is impossible to have a centralized authority deal with all of them. So we have to have a state-wise uh, separate authority for advance ruling. The only question is that there may be a person who is doing the same business in two states, more than one state. And in one state, giving the same facts, he gets one kind of a ruling. And in another state, giving the same facts, he gets different ruling. So what do we do about it? So the officers committee have discussed about it. And one of the possible solutions we are thinking of is that maybe at the appellate level, this can be combined. 
So if such a thing happens, then that person can go to the first appeal, the appellate level, and the appellate authority for advance ruling can straighten it. They can give a single uniform ruling. Mr. Adhya, uh, you've been very kind to take all our questions, but a quick last one before I let you go. And this really has to do with the whole macroeconomic scenario and how GST was meant to add about 2% to India's GDP growth. Now, while that was perhaps true for an ideal GST that, that included everything, what sort of contribution do you believe the present GST framework can make to economic growth uh, over the medium term? And how soon do we uh, see that happen? Uh, Supriya, we are already seeing the benefit of uh, GST having been implemented. Uh, even post demonetization in the last uh, one year, we have seen quick pickup in the GDP growth rate. And that is very remarkable. The pickup is very remarkable. And we will see even going forward all the projections for 1819 uh, and projections for 1920 as given by IMF, World Bank, everybody. They are very buoyant projections. And I would like to believe that part of the reason for this kind of a buoyancy in our growth rate is also because of a simplified system of taxation in which logistics costs are reduced, the tax rates are reduced, compliance cost is reduced, and the manufacturing sector particularly, they are very, very happy with it. Mr. Ajay, I'm going to try my luck and slip in one last question on a lighter note. What, according to you, has been the biggest learning as you rolled out this massive tax reform? What has been the biggest learning for the, uh, for the Revenue Department and for you? My biggest learning is that if you want to do anything new, you can take care of everything else, but just keep a watch on the technology. Technology is something which is very tricky and that can fail you that, anytime. <laughs> I think that is just so apt, is it not, that technology, which is supposed to be the answer to all our issues, can also be sometimes be the biggest hurdle. But I think on that note, Mr. Hasmu Kadia, India's Finance Secretary, can't thank you enough for joining us right here on ET Now. As India gets together and celebrates one year of the GST rollout, we do hope that the glitches will be taken care of from here on. And we do hope there will be a more ideal GST going forward and benefits from GST will begin accruing for the Indian economy. Thanks very much, sir, for being with us. Okay, on that note, we'll slip into a short break uh, right here on the India Development Debate News and updates continue with Avan on the other side. Keep it with ET now.